California, but got to travel around the United States a little bit and live in different places, but got to come home to the home mountains of the Sierra Nevada. And um, about 15 years after my first job out of college in Sequoia National Park, I wrote a travel guide to uh, share this wonderful place with all of the people who live around here and all the people who travel miles and miles to see the largest living beings on earth and uh, the highest trees and the deepest canyon. I can go on and on about all the superlatives, but it's a really spectacular place and I hope everyone gets as much joy from it as I do. My name is Patrick. Right now I'm, I'm an assistant principal in the Central Valley of California. And so my home park is Yosemite. It's an hour and 10 minutes from my front door. So I, I definitely take advantage. I go there every Wednesday night after work just to unwind. But I do love Sequoia and Kings Canyon, and I never miss out on them during the year. So there's so much love for those two. The superlatives are never ending for those two parks. We certainly got so much joy yeah. from visiting Sequoia and Kings Canyon. It's definitely, it was yeah. on the top, of, the top of our list. Yeah. <laughs> that canyon is something... Uh, I, I, nothing compares to that in my book, frankly. It's definitely a park to, too, that I think we, it's hard with Yosemite, Kings Canyon, and Sequoia being right there. You know, we had a few days for each, but it's definitely a space to continue to head back to, because I think it just felt the most magical, especially in Sequoia and Kings Canyon, especially because of the height of everything. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I feel like, um, a lot of people just come to Yosemite and tack on a day in Sequoia or Kings Canyon and really budgeting that extra time for the experiences you can have in those parks. It's going to be less crowded and it's like, don't tell Yosemite because she's got a little bit of an ego, but... <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Trail Mix by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Dusty. Trail Mix is the short format episodes of our show. Our long format episodes explore one hiking trail in one national park, one park at a time. Trail Mix allows us to dive deeper into things we didn't get to cover in our long format episodes. That's right. And this Trail Mix is another very special episode. For our last three Trail Mix of the season, we had the opportunity to interview several different people that have incredible reach and impact on the national parks and the outdoors in general. In our last Trail Mix episode, we had the wonderful experience of sitting down and chatting with Brad Ryan and Grandma Joy of Grandma Joy's Road Trip. If you haven't caught their story on the news in the last two years, Brad and Grandma Joy are on a journey crisscrossing the United States to see all of the 63 national parks. They only have a few parks left and most of them are in Alaska. When Grandma Joy told Brad that after living her life in Ohio, she had regretted never seeing the ocean or a mountain, their journey began in earnest. From an early start in the nearby Great Smoky Mountains to their looming trip to Alaska, Grandma Joy has seen more than just oceans and mountains, but the vastness of the American landscape. Their journey is a testament to so many things, but in many ways, it boils down to the beauty of the human spirit and the fact that there is so much life to live and so many beautiful places to see. Speaking of beautiful places, today's guests are big fans of some of our favorite beautiful places in California, Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Parks. That is absolutely correct. Talk about the land of beautiful giant trees. I wish that this space was in my backyard like it is for our two guests, Lee Bernacki and Patrick Rodden. Lee is a former National Park Service ranger who spent a lot of her formative years in the Sierra Nevada foothills and a decent chunk of her time as a park ranger in both of these parks. Patrick is an assistant principal and National Parks volunteer whose passion for the national parks has taken him to 227 of the 423 national park sites, including 50 of the national parks, especially those in his backyard, Yosemite and the aforementioned Kings Canyon and Sequoia. Part of what brought us together was moon travel guides and the fact that Lee had just completed writing the moon travel guide to Sequoia and Kings Canyon, hiking, camping, waterfalls, and big trees. In this episode, we had the incredible opportunity to sit down and talk with Lee and Patrick about Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Parks. 
I never considered myself a photographer at all. I've always played with cameras since I was young, and it's it's more of a cathartic exercise for me just to have a camera in my hands. I, I've never actually, and I know this is crazy, printed one of my prints before. It, it's always gone just digitally online, and, and it has been picked up, and I was really lucky that Moon, you know, respected enough to, to put in the back leaf of their book, and just, you know, it, it's gotten picked up by the U.S. Interior a few times. I've been in one of their publications too that goes out to all of their employees and you know they're just they're things here and there that I've been picked up on that feels really great uh <laughs> with photography I struggle with editing process so you know what you see is what you're probably going to get when you go somewhere there's not much of a um an illusion that I've created because none of these places need any type of extra editing at all I try to keep everything you know just restore colors and that's it but i mean it's just it's a way for me to uh just kind of get out some of my nervous energy and also it just a way to keep practicing something because you know there's always something to learn with a camera and speaking of moon travel guides they are the folks that brought all of us together today uh because lee you just wrote a brand new book you wrote the moon travel guide for sequoia and king's canyon what was the process like from like the very beginning of like the inception of writing that book you had to do a lot of unbelievable things in order to get all the information you needed to get in order to write that book crawling on the ground trying all the pie at that one restaurant there's so many things that uh, you had to do in order to write that book. So we are so curious. Like, take us back to the beginning. I guess I'll just give a, a shout out first to the good people at Moon because this book was an opportunity to engage with a different part of myself than I had for many years. And it was like a hard thing at a hard time. And I feel like it helped heal me think that after the time we've all had with COVID and everything that um, there's nothing as restorative as nature and national parks and the freedom you can have there. So I just hope everyone can spend some time with their friends, family, or alone in the national parks because um, just thinking about this book for a couple of years helped me a lot. And then the moon folks are amazing. They really focus on getting everyone out there, like making it accessible, eco, kid friendly, family friendly, but also like solo friendly. Um, not if you're like a gung ho green jean wearing ranger, can you only go to these certain places? It's like everyone has an opportunity to explore the national parks. Here's how to do it. Plus it's handy to have a book because um, the Wi-Fi is so poor and the cell <laughs> yeah. service yes. is so poor yes. up there. <laughs> In the summer of 2018, I was expecting my child and um, my job was running out at the University of California Merced. And so I was like, what am I going to do? And a friend sent me this opportunity to write a guidebook. And Moon is explicit. They're like, you cannot send us a proposal to write about any place that you just want to spend a lot of time at. Like, you need to know that place. And I was like, the only place I know that well is Sequoia and Kings Canyon. And so I submitted this, like, 60-page kind of proposal that laid out all that I would write. And then it took a couple of years for me to finish all of the images and to research all the trails and to get some of the history there were some definite holes that I had from my education and from when I was a ranger there. Like, um, I wasn't as interested in human history when I was 22. <laughs> and then eventually, like, added some layers in terms of, like, understanding geology or, like, deeper ecological understanding. I was a ranger in Denali National Park and Preserve for a summer, and that gave me new eyes on the Sierra. And then I had two years on the eastern side of the Sierra as a ranger for Yosemite. So um, I feel like it just gave me a chance to take all of the things I love about the natural world and learn new human history and put it into one text. It's really amazing to kind of just think about, because Patrick, you have, you have experience too working with the ranger program in some way too, to think about 
how invested you can get into a space and the magic that it must be to be able to... I mean, even you, Patrick, with living an hour and 10 minutes from Yosemite, I'm not not jealous over here. <laughs> um, but it's it's got to be incredible to like really... Those are like your home parks. It's it's That's something that we, the both of us, don't necessarily have. Our closest are are Shenandoah and Acadia. And we're not complaining about that, but they're not an hour and 10 minutes by no, any means. No, they're like so, three and a half mm-hmm. is Shenandoah. Yeah. yeah, three and a half, four, and Acadia is like eight. How did your experience inform your photography? And how did that kind of push you into that, you know, working with the national parks as spaces beyond just things that are just around you in your everyday? Uh, I grew up on the East Coast. I grew up in South Carolina about... Uh, 20 minutes away from Congaree. So I grew up going to the National Monument all the time, and it really shaped my experiences, like really understanding the importance of giving some validation to these places that have so much history and ecology. And then uh, I had family that lived on the edge of Great Smoky Mountain, so that was somewhere I was in all the time, the Blue Ridge Parkway and all of that. So I spent my time on the East Coast, but after uh, I went to school uh, for education, I ended up moving to Chicago for 10 years. And I was there initially just for grad school, then got pulled out here to California uh, just on a whim. And uh, really that and that happened five years ago, really started to reshape the way I thought about public lands and national parks and investing my time in them. Because the time that I was in the city, I was just around city all the time. You know, there's not, uh, there are parks around Chicago, but they take a lot of time. So, you know, most of my time was eaten up with city life. And then once I got out here and and really started getting in depth of learning about, you know, why the parks were established, I, I, I got really kind of almost bonkers about them and crazy and even more, (laughs) <laughs> invested and in what the National Park Service meant, what the U.S. Interior attempts to do and tries to do, and then, you know, how we as a country try to understand these places that have such interesting histories to them and complicated histories to them. So as I got out here, I ended up upping my total of, like, national parks. I had only been to Yosemite and Congaree and Great Smoky Mountains and, like, Shenandoah and all that, like, big ones prior to moving out here and now I just hit my 50th national park and like my 178th unit out of this park service and so like I've just been really eating it up and so then I started taking pictures of them as I've always done and have really just tried to use photography as a way to teach people about places and that's what I try to use Instagram for and you know some days I get a little ranty on it but you know I I just feel like People need to understand that these places are there. And I enjoy what Lee said as well a little while ago about Moon, you know, being a community and a a publisher that really, really wants to bring everybody to parks to learn every piece about them. So anyway, that's kind of my story. And then I got involved in volunteering at Pinnacles National Park. And I I felt so proud whenever they handed me the like official name badge (laughs) and plate and everything. But then the pandemic came along and they haven't taken volunteers back, but I mean, just being able to get out there and educate people through photography or educate people in the actual space has just like, it, it's changed my life so much. Lee, tell us a little bit about some of the, like on your journey to fill in the holes for this book, like what are some of the um, things you had to do that were a little unexpected? To me, some of it wasn't unexpected because I got to just live the life of a traveler sometimes and take copious amounts of notes. But my favorite part about it was bringing along friends and family who hadn't been to certain places and getting their language. Like my hilarious friend Amelia went and explored two areas with me and she had been to neither. And she, I was like, how would you read that dinner we had? And she came up with better than average, average Mexican. And so like stealing clever lines from my friends and um, incorporating them, you know, it was it was just wonderful to think about what information would help a traveler make a decision, which is a perspective I hadn't taken before. Um, But I mean, if you're a naturalist ranger or interpretive ranger at the parks, you basically stand at a desk part time. Also, like 
shout out. This is a great starting job right out of college. They have a bunch of different um, levels that you can come in on. And um, I feel like I hit the lottery twice when I got to work at these different parks. You stand at the desk and you try to learn enough about the person to um, figure out what itinerary you would recommend for them. And then when you take people on a walk or a talk or take them up more a rock and explain the exfoliation dome of the big granite and try to make it interesting for that age group, it's like a very empathetic experience. So I feel like I got to tap into that um, former life of like, how do I, who is this hike best for, you know, and thinking about it. So that was, that was kind of the unexpected parts, but in terms of exploring and, and doing different things, I was kind of systematic about looking at trails that I knew I needed to explore more or like get more details on like um Kings Canyon had that huge fire and I'm not sure when you came Dusty and Mike you were was we were there in 2018 yeah 2018 yeah. so that was after the big fire which birthed a bunch of baby sequoias <laughs> so right. there are some benefits Yes. Um, there's lots of benefits to you. We um, yes. listened to that's, a ranger talk. This is where and we that's learned where we the learned. benefits of we were forest like, fires. They were like, oh, yeah, that's part of sequoia a, groves. Yeah. It's part of a forest natural life cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like there wouldn't be sequoias without fire. Yeah, one one trail I came back to from 2004 to 2020, <laughs> or actually 19, uh, it had burned. And so then I had to like re-navigate it and remind myself like, oh, this is still really beautiful. It's just totally totally devoid of pines and now I can see the sandy soil there's these harlequin lupin that are like hot pink with yellow in the center on the sandy soil there's all these like black lizards that are okay there now because it's all charred it's just great to see a place evolve and that's that's why I love going back to the same place over and over oh that's such a great piece of advice seeing something evolve over time because we've always said that we're like you know it's never the same like when you return and like it's uh, like even people who are like oh i like loop trails instead of there and back trails and i'm like well you get a different experience on your way back like you will see it from a literally a different perspective we did a whole trail mix on sequoia trees if a sequoia tree is in front of you like the amount of resilience and the amount of like survival it has gone through to come to life is unbelievable because it's like so many of them don't like those seeds fall and it's just like just so many of them don't take and to see the scars the fire scars that are as tall as whatever tree burned up right next to it yes um or like the big janky arms that are like seven feet in diameter and that's bigger than any other pine tree in the forest Mm -hmm. i just Every which way, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, morning, noon, night, thousands of people around me or by myself, it's like your mind cannot understand what a sequoia is. It breaks your camera. Right, yeah. Patrick? Like, it cannot fit in a frame. You're like, <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to capture your no, glory it and it yeah. won't let you. Yes. Yeah. No, I had to turn. To we get did it, a we had to panorama t- view. Panorama going straight up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's how we and were that's able to how get we got it. <laughs> Patrick, tell us about your time in Sequoia and Kings Canyon and maybe what it's like to photograph Sequoia trees. Well, I, I agree with everything everyone just said about taking pictures of them. It's a really odd experience. Really, what I focus more on with them is the detail in them and maybe pieces of them. I remember one shot that I took of Sherman from coming down from the upper parking lot going down the trail to Sherman, which just emits the other trees. But even though it was at, you know, a distance and I had other trees closer, it was still larger than anything else. It was really cool. It's so cool to get the perspective of these trees against the trunks of the other ones. But as far as like full blown uh, photographs of them, I've I've laid on the ground a couple of times uh, and <laughs> And pulled out like a wide angle lens and that's still sketchy sometimes because you still can't get them. I've done the pano thing with my phone too, like you were saying that you've done and it's, uh, it, it also doesn't quite capture it. And the great part about like looking at people that are, are true, true, true photographers that get in there, you know, some pictures that I've seen in Nat Geo of them 
are so incredible with the vantage points that people have gotten like in winter with the snow and that's something that i'd love to do i have not been in that park in the snow i'm not a fan of chains i mean i've or the cables for my car which i've used several times but it's just more of a an experience that my mind doesn't want to wrap around <laughs> Um, and plus, after moving from Chicago out here, I try to stay away from snow sometimes. Uh, <laughs> That's fair. So, fair. Yeah. Yeah. You know, thinking about Sequoia and Kings Canyon and, and looking at them, I wish I had more of Lee's perspective of it, just as far as like the amount of time that she's gotten to spend in there. I, I've done more than just day trips out there. But the thing is, is I think I've I've truly experienced them more from the aspect of a a tourist almost rather than a local and it's it's been really interesting my experiences in there have been on main trails that a lot of people go on i've uh done very little backcountry in there and part of it is is during the season that is easier to backcountry i'm usually out of california visiting family or going off and doing other things and then by the time i get back i'm invested in work and I don't have the time to spread out these long trips. It's so cool to be in a place where as popular as they are, it still seems like a hidden place, especially when you get away from Sequoia and go down into Kings Canyon. Yeah, Patrick, I hear you. Um, I, I think the only real locals are the animals and trees that get to live in Sequoia and Kings Canyon full time like the Sierra Nevada de denizens they definitely lucked out um, it in terms of a hospitable and inviting place to live and and spend your existence I I always feel like a tourist or a guest that is temporarily invited into the realm where the greatest beings live. So I just feel like it's a privilege every time we get to go. Lately, I've been thinking about who built these roads and who built these trails and that history is amazing. There's a new book about the trails, um, uh, especially the High Sierra Trail, thinking about that. So um, yeah, those access points and the, 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 the parks allow us to get in there. You made the point of just visiting the main trails and I hope in my book that the visitors find that you can go to the main site, like the General Sherman tree, the largest tree in the world. But if you go two miles on any of the trails around Giant Forest, and there's over 50 of them, then you're going to be by yourself. You're going to be visiting like rarely visited trees. You're going to find a weird cabin that a shepherd lived in. You know, you're going to find <laughs> yes. like, a tree oh, that yeah. used to be a, home. a saloon. Right. And, you yeah. know, yeah. It's it's so wild. It is it is the strangest and you really there's no way to describe it. You can tell people about it all you want, but until you're actually there, the feeling is so uh, humbling. I think it's the most one of the most humbling experiences I've had in nature just because everything is so massive. <laughs> and I remember getting yeah. out of the car and I was like could smell. Oh my god. I mean, you can never replace that. That is an experience I will never forget in my whole life is getting out of the car at Sequoia and going like, oh my God, like just smelling all of them. Yeah, and Kathleen Dean Moore talks about the different smells in the shade versus the sun. I feel like on a oh. sunny slope on mm -hmm. Big Baldy, it's pure pennyroyal mint. And mm. then you go a little bit down into a shady ravine and all you smell is elderberry and then you see all the buzz of bees around it and mm. you're like, oh, it's a whole new sensory experience. And I have yeah. a terrible sense of smell. So if I can smell it, anyone can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's something too in a national park. Most people, I would say, are really your sense of sight is the thing that is probably the most overwhelmed. And maybe it's it's not that often that we think about the sen our sense of smell and those spaces because you're right there are definitely those changing smellscapes and even in the sun and the shade it's different and it's such a beautiful thing to be able to have that invitation to use a word that you used earlier Lee to be there um, to be able to like experience that for however long or short you get that experience yeah the first thing I do whenever I get to a Sierra Nevada Creek or lake or river 
is smell the water. There's no smell like the Sierra Nevada River water because it's straight snow melt into that beautiful granite bed and it just has its own smell. And I think most of us don't experience the smell of water at home, at least. I don't know that I've ever thought of that. I think I guess for... I, I just, I'm used to it from living by the beach my entire life. I mean, so beach, I've got that beach like salt, water. you know, salt water. Oh, salt smell. that's yeah. definitely mm-hmm. something. Take a breath and smell the water. Oh, mm. that's a great piece of advice. Yeah. Thinking about Patrick having a, having opportunities to go into the back country, uh, Sequoia, Kings Canyon and Yosemite, obviously like very, um, temperate climates. Like it doesn't get that cold in the summer. Um, the mosquitoes aren't as big as they are in Alaska. You know, there's not that many poisonous things. And the, the mountain lions that you would get to see are so rare and so beautiful. Like you're more grateful for the opportunity to even see their paw print than you are afraid of them. So it's like, it's where I did my first solo backpacking. And I went several times just by myself for a couple nights and I haven't done it for a long time. Um, I think my fear sensors are higher now that I'm a mom or something, but it is just, it's one of the best places to get your start. And I think if you haven't tried backpacking, REI has trips, Sequoia Conservancy has trips. You can often find like groups in your community who will travel there, like churches often go to those parks so I know there's opportunities to get your start in the backcountry in Sequoia and Kings Canyon in particular um, and it it is a life-altering experience so speaking of trails do you remember any of the trails that you've done in Sequoia my one of my favorite hikes was with my friend Amelia we were going up to Eagle Lake which is in Mineral King the southern side of the park and you pass through a sequoia grove to get there and then you drive to the end of this long windy dirt road not for the faint of heart um but then the hike is amazing you're climbing up the edge of a glacier carved valley and there are all these bright crimson penstemon and then there are hummingbirds drinking from all the pensamen and in the background are like the orange and ochres of like the metamorphic cap of the Sierra, like the ancient seabeds that are at the very top of the mountains right now. I don't know. It was kind of mind blowing, but my favorite part was to arrive at this lake and to hear the voices of children and all these people around it, like miles into this weird place, just delighting in it, like the echoes of people's voices off of the granite around us. It was just a perfect day. And we ended it up, up with a lot of pie and beer. <laughs> yes. Ain't that how to end, to end the day, day. <laughs> right? A pie lot of beer. pie and beer. <laughs> it's a surprisingly good combo and nutritious. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've done pretty much everything like giant forests, and and Lee was talking about going two miles away from Sherman. I've done all of that stuff back in there. I don't know the names of it, but weaving in and out of all the trails that encompass the giant forest, um, moving over into Kings Canyon into like the the Grant Grove, which is so easy to do, and then going down in the canyon and just I I remember doing so much walking going into the meadow and then starting on some of the Ray Lakes loop but I I know and Lee might be able to confirm this I I feel like that's starting to be like a more heavily permitted place now and and I'm so bad with permits because I feel like anytime I go in a lottery for one or try to get one I can't get one (laughs) so been to both of the parks multiple times but i'm just revisiting all of these same places within the parks just to see again and and i'm a simple person so it makes sense for me yeah just to put a finer point on the permits it's it's a game and it's a dangerous game that our access to parks is controlled by online private companies and so like people can pay bots to get them campsites on memorial day weekend in yosemite valley that doesn't happen by getting up at 7 a.m and clicking the button you know at the right time that happens because 
um, people are using technology to gain greater access to our public places. It's just something I want us to all be aware of. You have to plan way in advance. I've missed a lot of lotteries. I've picked random dates that didn't end up working and trying to open them up so that other people can use them in time. But it's it makes it a lot harder to access the parks, but thankfully there's these gateway communities um, like Visalia and you can stay a little farther away but still be able to come in. So there's ways to overcome it if you don't get the, the campground reservation or the backcountry permit that you're hoping for. And also like you can usually get a walk-up permit. It just might not be to your desired place, which has happened to me in Glacier and other parks too, but um, you really can't lose in Sequoia and Kings Canyon. So it, if you don't get your desired permit, it, it'll work out. <laughs> I just spent all of Thursday on recreation.gov securing places for Haleakala this summer that oh. just opened that just opened up on Thursday. I needed to get back country camping for there and was able to manage snagging a couple of spots. So definitely it is an interesting experience, as you were saying, dealing with like third party companies and technology to gain these places. And I, and I guess for when you're doing something like that, going so far, there's an advantage to it, but at the same time, it, it, it's almost like a, a hunger games game of Thrones thing where you're, you know, everybody's in trying to go after something and it can get difficult. Have you been to Haleakala before Patrick? I have not. Oh. This will be my, my first time. Probably one of my favorite yeah. trails in all of the whole MPS is there are which is the sliding sands trail that like changes it, it's like the 13 it's, mile it's like yeah. it's a 13 mile you have to like you have to hitchhike to the top hitchhike to the top you have to park down at the bottom hitchhike to the very top and then you do 13 miles back to where you parked it's incredible it is <laughs> i don't have words to describe it it is it is so it is 17 different landscapes all in like 13 miles. Unfortunately, with COVID and all of that, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to hitchhike is the issue. Sure. <laughs> there is this that. Year. Yes, yes. Sure. You know, but I, I do know that one of the, the backcountry camping experiences that I booked is down off of sliding sand. So at least I'll oh, get, you'll get to do a part of yeah. it. A, yeah. A few miles of it, which I'm really excited yeah. about. So, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to to think about like permitting and things like that. Um, only because we our experience really hasn't been through a lot of backcountry in what we've experienced in the parks. I, I think our one permit experience was um, the Timichi route in uh, Black, Black Canyon, Canyon of the Gunnison, Gunnison, which we was did. like a walk up you know, you could get it right there. And it was really just so they would know if you were still in the canyon and they needed to rescue you kind of thing. Um, so it is interesting to to think about that, Lee, to your, you know, to your point earlier, um, because even in booking things over the summer, this is the first time that we'll be camping in actually a national park proper. We're on our way back. We're hitting the Smokies for a third time. And that is where we were able to get a campsite through recreation.gov. So, um, it is a, it's a process that, you know, we're starting to like develop into more and, and work with a little bit more now that we're camping a lot more. Cause that was not our, our necessarily our process for visiting parks for a long time. So like you were saying too, just with even being able to go to a gateway community and stay somewhere and then drive in or do what you need to, that was a lot of our, our initial experience. And I have to say to that point, it's those gateway communities do offer a lot. There, There is a lot there. Um, I wouldn't even say that we were in a gateway community when we were in Fresno as no, much Fresno, as your gateway yeah, community that stayed. you were talking about. But it did, as we said, was like, it was like the, the bottom part of the fork. And it was like each of the tines was like, here's Yosemite, here's Kings Canyon, here's Sequoia. So it did give us like a central point to like jump off from. But I do think being able to get into the culture of the area and experience those small towns that surround a park is also 
as much of an interesting experience as being in the park itself because it really does give you that sort of sense for what that community is like and how that community is built up around that space. What advice would you give to a first-time traveler to Sequoia and Kings Canyon? First-time traveler, be prepared to have your mind blown. I would pack a little picnic and then I would plan to spend two or three days either in the park or coming back and out, back and forth into the gateway communities. I think the most charming parts of Sequoia and Kings Canyon are the sequoias, but also like the, the views of the granite mountains. So I would want to, to visit the General's Highway, which traverses the whole park. But I would, I wouldn't rush like a bunch of the RVs. I would stop along the highway and look down into the valleys of lemon groves and citrus groves, and then wind my way up into Granite Grove um, for my morning with the the sequoia trees. And then if I needed to stretch my legs, I would go to um, one of my favorite view hikes, which is uh, Buena Vista Peak, because you can get up on this little granite hump a little dome that's poking out on the kind of front edge of the sierra and then you can look into redwood mountain grove which is like a sacred heart grove and all along the ridge are like these big domes of the sequoias popping up and towering above the rest of the trees then I would probably want want to get a swim in so I would go down into Kings Canyon and as uh, Dusty and Mike said that's a really special place so that's kind of a more uh, driving tour and looking at weird geology and getting a swim in the Kings River and then the, the next two days I would spend in giant forest and lodgepole area so um, I'm kind of showing my bias there but that, <laughs> thank, that thank is you for a planning really my next place. trip I really appreciate it oh, I yeah. can't wait <laughs> <laughs> My biggest thing is arrive early when you go. You know, spending time with the trees uh, with relatively few people is unbelievable. Is As far as one of my first experiences, and I would recommend it to anybody that was even just doing a day, there is just go walk amongst the, amongst the giants uh, in the giant forest, but then go check out Grant Grove too. But I, I spent my very first time there uh i just went up to the easily accessed panorama point and did my first astrophotography there ever and just really spent an evening by myself looking out over the mountains and it was it was magical to say the least so uh definitely you know arrive early and just take in everything you can Oh, Patrick, thank you for reminding me. Panoramic Point is easily accessible by wheelchair. And then the dark skies, like we have a dark sky festival every August and the night skies in Sequoia and Kings Canyon are like unparalleled for their proximity to a city of a million people. We did Morrow Rock um, while we were there. Yes, (laughs) we did. And um, (laughs) so I have a few huge fear of heights that is uh something i you know deal with because i'm like i want to do it i also know how i'm going to feel when i do it but i still want to do it you know like there's a lot of that and um seeing moro rock from the side i was petrified totally frozen i still did it i um i do moro rock again before i did angel's landing the chains on angel's landing again (laughs) that's for sure (laughs) I'm not usually affected by height and that Mora Rock kind of threw me into a little bit of a tailspin because it was it was just different. It was unassumingly frightening for me (laughs) once I was on it. Yeah, Angel's Landing I did for a sunset hike in Zion or sunrise hike. So I didn't know I was on the chains at night, like really. And then coming back, I was like, excuse me. um, (laughs) I was not informed of this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, and Moral Rock has that terrifying element because there's usually about 55 people jammed up in one corner and like three of them are wearing high heels, four of them are carrying backpacks. There's usually a loose toddler and um, there's a busload the coming behind yep. you. Yeah. 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 
That's a great way to describe it. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a little wild up there. Did you get the t-shirt though? Did I get, you know, no, did I we get, didn't get the t-shirt. I didn't and get the Moral Rock your, t-shirt. That's usually your I, uh, I should get the Moral Rock. I did get the Angel's Landing t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Did you enjoy the view though? The view is was, you know, the view that was, was incredible. Amazing. That was an incredible you, overlook. It of feels all like of you're that. literally just floating in like the middle of this giant open vast area you know like it's i i can i can't compare it to anything else i've experienced one time i was up there and a pair of baby spotted skunks were up there and then they just walked straight down the face (gasps) i don't know where they were going they just went in the night (gasps) like no big deal oh my god (laughs) Clearly, they knew something that none of us did. <laughs> the meaning Secrets. of life. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, it's a special place, but I try to encourage people to go to other um, rocky outcrops like Little Baldy, Big Baldy, Buena Vista, Panorama. You know, like there's no shortage of great vantage points from General's Highway. So, like, if crowds aren't your thing, or um, really high exposure isn't your thing then there's alternatives that sounds like coming up out of the bright angel trail in the grand canyon uh <laughs> yeah. i do really appreciate what you said about and that's something that we always well that i always go goad him into to doing is is getting to a place early we were when we got to both king's canyon and then the next day when we got to sequoia we were there early and it was like spring. It was our spring break and probably sometime in April that year that we were there. And it was fairly quiet just in general. Like I do feel like we got to see, we got to see Sherman with like no one around. Um, We got to walk, you know, Grant's Grove with like next to no one. And even just the, um, the Congress trail in the giant forest um, and going through the Senate group and all those groupings, it was really just us and it really it there is nothing that compares to that sort of feeling of that smallness and then also that sort of reverence for being there and experiencing that we always found when we would tell people like oh yeah we were going to sequoia oh the redwoods that's always we i always get that response i'm like no nope. No, the so, <laughs> I, so when after we left Sequoia, we were like, I think we need to do a trail mix episode all about how Sequoia trees are different, di- not redwood, like yeah. not the same yeah. as redwood trees. <laughs> so, um, even though redwoods have their own national park. I mean, working in Yosemite Valley when I was 18, I got a lot of questions like, where are the geysers? Um, and sure. I, I think that it's a it's a problem like everyone goes to the national parks and they're like oh i'm here why am i here you know because someone told them that it was great or that that like there's something superlative about each place but um i i found usually people that were making a a a error in their expectation like um do you have any faster rides kind of questions um right like they they usually softened and opened up to what was there uh but i'm really glad that you covered the the cousin trees you know because they're both rare but i love thinking about the giant sequoias as vastly abundant when the dinosaurs were around and then now like as the climate has cooled they're only in this little band on the western side of the sierra nevada in this specific range of snowfall it's wild and water and they need fire so it's like snow and ice and like guys like loosen up a little um <laughs> like <laughs> we don't know where they to require a lot yes yes yeah, a, lot of, a lot very picky but yeah. um the ones that survive it's amazing right yeah it's amazing it's incredible, it's incredible. We are both teachers. Mike is a middle school art teacher. I'm a theater teaching artist. So I do a lot of 
teaching theater in schools for theater companies. But both of you have very unique educational experiences. And I'm curious about how does your love for the outdoors and how does your passion for the outdoors inform your educational work? What I'm really lucky to have is our curriculum here in California, at least the curriculum my school uses uh, for eighth grade social studies covers uh, national parks and the formation of them. So the the teachers often will pull me in and have me talk about the National Park Service and share pictures and stories. And, you know, just to get, get the kids excited, uh, many of them haven't even been to Yosemite and it's so close and they don't even know it exists. And so getting to teach them about it last year, right before COVID, we managed to gain two of the grants from Kids to Parks from the National Park Trust and ended up not being able to use them for travel because we were supposed to go to Yosemite using the grant money in May of 2020 and that got completely knocked out. So the money had to be siphoned into different usages and and ways for educational purposes in the classroom. But, you know, just really being able to speak to kids about it makes me ecstatic in the workplace when I have a moment my office is covered with national park stuff and and so that gives up the opportunity to talk to kids when they come in just about why it's there and it's also kind of an icebreaker if there's a discipline issue or something you know we've got something else to talk about too just to make the kids more comfortable that I'm a human rather than a just a a person that has to investigate something so anyway, that's that's how I use it. it. It definitely comes to work with me. And I try to get faculty to go with me up to Yosemite, too. And I think we're actually going to do that in May. A group of us are going to go up and, and just spend the evening there and eat and take pictures and all of that. Yeah, it's a privilege to um, speak with educators, especially this year. Um, I really admire all you're doing to, to save our youth, you know. Um, I, I'm a teacher's kid, and uh, actually both my parents were uh, teachers, and I, I feel like the national parks are a wonderful laboratory. They're a place to learn history, archaeology, every single field. Um, and for my research, I kind of, I'm very omnivorous in my research, but I um, Like I was writing nature writing for my master's and I was like, oh, I don't think people read this anymore. Like it seems very 18th century. Um, And then I went on to study wildlife and fisheries sciences um, for my doctorate because I was like, well, we'll use rational choices. We'll make decisions based on like the science. Well, that the science is interpreted by people. So... (laughs) Um, So then, now, many years later, my real focus is on natural resources and public participation. And so that's why I wrote this book, is it's about access. It's about um, creating our own relationship with the places around us. And when I moved back to California in 2015 and lived in the San Joaquin Valley, I realized, like Patrick was talking about, how many students and children have not visited the parks of our home. They don't have that sense of pride that I do when I look out my window and see the snowy capped mountains. Um, so that this book is a love letter to the San Joaquin Valley residents. Like this is our home, this is right here. Grab your fourth grader and go to the parks for free or for the price of a day at the movies, uh, take your whole family for a picnic under the sequoias. So. It's, it's really um, just an opportunity to learn more about the world and about ourselves. We have to get on a trail together, y'all. <laughs> Let us know when you're coming, please. <laughs> I will drop everything to go on a hike with you. Let's yes. go. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have... We still have many parks that we're, we want to visit. West Coast. Uh, yeah, on the California. West Coast. So mm-hmm. we're going to get there soon. Yeah. How far west are you coming this summer? 
We're we going to Glacier in Montana. And Yellowstone and um, yeah. Teton. So that'll Very be as far about west it. as we'll be. Yeah. Speaking of recreation.gov, yeah. like I have like the thing set on my phone to like get the Glacier Reservation that opens up Thursday. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's Get ready for that, to that clogged up recreation.gov. <laughs> Right. Get ready for it to say system, system waiting. System yeah. waiting. Yep. Yep. Kind of rounding back on the the beginning of the conversation, or back to when we were talking for a moment about Moon attempting to continue to make parks more inclusive for everyone and educating and, and showing people that they are for everyone. But then there's also that aspect of uh, remembering the people that curated the land here first. And, and so really going into not only remembering that we're, we're trying to bring people around in the 21st century to national parks to learn how to enjoy them, but also kind of bringing into the 21st century that we are, uh, there's definitely a need to recognize the Native American influence of the parks and how they've been shaped over, I mean, thousands of years and just the curation that went into the land. And, you know, now how there's this uh, this push now to get, you know, especially with the fire season that happened in California this past year to to start getting, you know, more of the practices back in that Native Americans use and getting Native Americans back on the land to help manage parks. So I just I think it's a good thing to remember that as we enjoy them, that there there were people here that uh that lost land and then at the same time as we're moving forward there are people here too that don't feel included on the land so there there's so many different aspects to think about while you're out there enjoying that you know they're just there's so many facets that go into a national park from the past which is very complicated to the present which is very complicated to the future of management which is very complicated too I hope everyone sees themselves in a national park, like get out and see yourself in a national park. Um, There's history of the roads and the first protectors of Sequoia were African-American soldiers um, protecting those lands. And there's a Buffalo Soldier um, event and there's several trees named after uh, uh, African Americans including Colonel Young who was leading that troop um, and then I think it's one of the most spectacular places to see pictographs from uh, Native American peoples and learning about the first peoples uh, the diversity of tribes and the diversity of language groups that converged in this area so going to Hospital Rock which is 45 minutes from Visalia and seeing those pictographs on the underside of a rock that has lasted hundreds of years, natural pigments and depictions of different animals that, um, that have lived there for millennia. And I hope everyone gets to see themselves in the future of the parks. It's, it's up to us to protect them going forward. We'd love to end this interview with a game. We love to throw a game into all of our trail mixes. We invent our own trail games because we like are constantly on the trail. Like, especially when we hit like, like our bodies Mm -hmm. have been moving for 17 miles and our minds are, it's like we need something to activate our minds. So this game is called the vault. So this is how it works. Um, We're going to give you a category. You have to choose three things from that category to put in the vault forever. Everything else is no more so choose wisely so the category is trail snacks what three trail snacks are you going to throw into the vault and um keep forever everything else will be destroyed this is so hard especially when i thought you were thinking i thought the vault was like what animal are you going to save and then once it oh, turned into oh snacks, no we would never do like, that okay no, no, no. no we're not going to eat a manager okay <laughs> No, no, no. no, we wouldn't. No, 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 no. All species deserve to be saved and protected. We wouldn't do that to anybody. So, <laughs> but yes, but trail snacks. I'm going to go for it. Baby carrot, 
string cheese, any kind of nut. <gasps> okay. Oh, great. Baby string cheese carrots, is a good. String cheese is a good one. We have never taken string, done string cheese, cheese on the trail, and we should do that. Yeah. that is a good idea. Oh, it's uh, that was one of mine. Oh. So I'm I'm glad that there's something that <laughs> that comes up that's the same here because <laughs> then I feel really bad about the other two because they're <laughs> garbage but sustainable. Great. It, this is the monster mix from Target. Oh, yes, uh, yeah, that fully. has like the peanuts and raisins, M and M. You know, it's of course I'm eating all the M and M's out of it by the time the first mile of the trail happens. Also, just Cheez Its too. Cheez Its, yes. sodium yes. everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yes, for sodium, sodium, sodium. 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 I'm here for you, that. Listen, Patrick. Patrick sodium. This is a safe space <laughs> for garbage food. All right. <laughs> so, well, our favorite tip: Do not mix the hard boiled eggs and the Cheez Its in the same bag, because oh. crumpled up hard boiled eggs coated in a Cheez It is not a good combo. That is We're a not good. That is a hot tip. Hot tips coming in. <laughs> that is Lee. a hot tip. That's great. Here to help. That's great. What are your that. what are your trail snacks? Well, in that's the a good question. Like, um, I would have to say, like, well, now Patrick brought up Cheez Its, so I feel like the Twisted Fritos. Listen, oh, the honey those, barbecue, the honey barbecue Twisted Fritos, sodium, some sort of granola bar of some sort, um, and then I think I'm gonna go with like also like junky junk and some sort of like beef jerky something creation, slim jam, yeah. Yep, a Slim Jim. Snap him into a Slim Jim. I'm into that. I'm into that. I think I have to I have to do peanut butter on bagels. We bring that a lot because bagels don't smash as easily in a bag. Dried banana chips. Oh, I could eat my weight in those. Those are so good. And then I also have to put the Fritos. I mean, we will go whole hog on the Fritos. <laughs> it's like we'll finish a trail and then it's like, Go to the convenience store, see if they have the Fritos. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I think it needs mm-hmm. to be adopted into our practice of just bringing them on the trail. We should too. just bring them on the trail, yeah. right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Pringles have those no crush cans. So if they haven't figured out the technology to preserve a Frito, oh. this is trail. Or you like if they Pringles invented later. a new backpack. Yeah. yeah. True. Or you just get a thing of Pringles. <laughs> Eat the Pringles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there the, you go. Put them there in the Pringles can. Where is the technology? Put that in Where the Where is the sponsorship from Frito Lay? Seriously, <laughs> we've given them a lot of <laughs> advertisement here. Yes. I did do a quick back of the envelope calculation, and your weight in uh, banana chips would be the size of a Toyota pickup. <gasps> wow. I could do it. Yeah. Yeah. I could do it. it. One day. One day. <laughs> One day. <laughs> This has been Trail Mix by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast, and we're here to remind you to hike early and hike often, and that adventure is always out there. Gaze at the National Parks was created and is hosted by us, Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan. To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at Gaze at the National Parks. To contact us, email us at gaze at the National Parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks visited on the show, visit our website, gaze at the National Parks.com. That's gaze, G A Z E. All original artwork featured on Instagram and on our website is by me, Michael Ryan. All original music was written by Dave Seaman and performed by Dave Seaman, Mariella Klinger, and Sean Sklios. Our music producer is Skylar Fortgang. This episode was edited by me, Dustin Ballard. We would also like to acknowledge that while recording this episode, that we were on the traditional and stolen lands of the Lenape people, also known as Middlesex County, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs>